Hello everyone and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today I am delighted to talk again to Imam Tom. Welcome back, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for having me again. Welcome assalam. Good to see you, Tom. As you, you will know, Tom has kindly agreed to discuss the books that have made a significant difference to him intellectually. And today Tom will continue to discuss an extremely important book, this one, and The Impossible State, Islam Politics and hey, and Modernity's Moral Predicament by Wael Halak. Now, before I mention who Halak is, I just noticed 10 minutes ago about the design of this cover. It's an impossible triangle. If you look at this triangle here, and I thought that looks suspiciously familiar. So I Googled it, and the impossible triangle is also known as the Penrose uh, Triangle, and it's an optical illusion. It's impossible. And there's a fantastic quote by the British Nobel Prize winning physicist, Sir Roger Penrose, who described it as, and I quote, an impossibility in its purest form. <laughs> so the publishers uh, are agreeing with Halleck that the idea of an Islamic state, because that's essentially this book, is an impossibility, uh, as beautifully and very cleverly illustrated, uh, I think. So um, Halleck, if you don't know, a uh, professor in the humanities at Columbia University in the US, where he's been teaching uh, ethics, law, and political thoughts since 2009. He's considered a leading scholar in the field of Islamic legal studies and has been described as one of the world's leading authorities on Islamic law. And he's a, a Palestinian Christian, originally born in a place called Nazareth. I don't know if you've heard of that, anyone? Um, now, obviously, lives in America. So, without more to do, over to you, sir. Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa rasulillah. Um, we're entering into a very crucial part of this book. Um, previously, we had talked about the modern state. What is it? What is modernity and what is the modern state? Hmm. Um, and today we're going to deal with Halak's main thesis, which is that this modern state that we have is not only un-Islamic, it is in fact anti-Islamic, and it is impossible to reconcile the two. If we want to um, talk about Islamic governance or Islamic political order, we can do so. But to assume that we can kind of take the machinery of the modern nation state and just kind of slap an Islamic label onto it, or even worse, um, say that we're using Islam as a source, quote unquote, mm -hmm. to make an Islamic state or a, an ostensible Islamic state, um, would be completely incorrect and a contradiction in terms. And so we're going to get at, I'm gonna give a brief recap of the essential forms or the essential form properties, the essential components of the modern state that we discussed last video, and then get into one of his central critiques of the modern state, which has to do with the way in which the modern state amalgamates or concentrates power in uh, an unethical and anti-Islamic way, despite the language of separation of powers and this sort of um, myth, we could say, that mm -hmm. there in fact is a separation of power within the modern state. Then we're going to look at what is Islamic governance? Mm -hmm. What is it at the, um, the fundamental paradigmatic level and what makes it so special and different from the modern state such that the two would be completely irreconcilable i can just pause, pause you there sorry to stop you a minute further time. it was as at this point in the third chapter of the uh the book which you're going to be discussing today that i finally understood uh very clearly what uh halak is on about the incompatibility he argues of the modern state with the islamic polity islamic governance as he calls it i really get it now and i think for me the third chapter we're looking at today is by far the most intellectually interesting and informative uh, so far anyway in the book and i really enjoyed uh discovering his thought uh, and his perspectives uh, absolutely fantastic anyway over to you right no very good so um so previously we had talked about the modern state what is it and um we wanted to make sure and this is something that even people who i've seen who have read halak um don't necessarily always demonstrate that they've grasped this point that modernity for halak and i completely agree is not about a, a time period which happens to be contemporaneous with the time in which we're living modernity refers to a certain arrangement a structural arrangement of law of sovereignty of ethics and morals and the subjects mm 
that are subjected to that those uh, that legal regime or those laws. Okay, so what is the, um, the the technology of a state? Recall is not something that is a universal category. It's not a transhistorical category. We can't go back in time and look at every single political unit and and unit of governance and call it a state. That would be anachronistic, and it would also conceal the ways in which the modern state is fundamentally different from previous governing technologies or arrangements that have come before. So what are those things that are essential to the modern state that set it apart? The first thing, there are five, uh, Halak calls them structure properties, um, as opposed to variable things of content that might come and go or might change. Um, so what are the essential structure properties of the modern state? One of, of which is that it is the product of specifically European history. Um, two is that its sovereignty and metaphysics is vested in something called the nation. Okay, that's so why we talk about the nation state. And the state derives its legitimacy from supposedly having the only right to represent that sovereign will of the nation. Mm. Um, that's going to be extremely significant to what we discussed today. The third has to do with legislation, law, and violence. This is a very commonly uh, observed feature is that uh, there is a monopoly not only on violence that the modern state enjoys, but also a monopoly on law. That's mm -hmm. also going to be extremely significant to today's discussion. Um, four, that the modern nation state is distinguished by a rational bureaucratic machine. And then five, that the modern nation state enjoys a cultural hegemony, um, mm -hmm. that it is able to to politicize and penetrate what is cultural in society in unique ways. And in fact, Halak, interestingly, um, distinguish, distinguishes a true modern nation state from many other sort of states that do exist today that he would say aren't completely modern nation states or not fully modern nation states because they don't in fact possess this quality of being able to penetrate culturally in the way that um, paradigmatic modern nation states such as the United States, such as UK, such as France, etc., are able to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all in brief what we what we discussed last time. Halak has a, a critique of the nation state, the modern nation state, and what makes it not just un-Islamic but anti-Islamic. Mm -hmm. And the crux of this critique is that the modern nation state, this arrangement of law and uh, governance and subjects and morality, it gathers power in unethical ways and in un-Islamic or anti-Islamic ways. It amalgamates, it collects power, and it basically forms a certain type of unity of power that is unimpeachable, that's unaccountable to anything else, and which is extremely problematic and achieves uh, or results in a sort of conflict of interest that is fundamental. It's not an accidental or contingent aspect of the modern nation state. It is essential, fundamental, and always present. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the this is, and he contrasts it. So how does he go about illustrating this point? He contrasts it with sort of the um, political mythos that we have about the separation of powers. And this is something you and I were talking before we went live about the um, American political culture and how it's specifically relevant to American political culture, um, but also present in other modern nation states, such as Britain, which has a parliamentary system, any type of representative democracy or, or representative republic or any type of nation state at all. Um, it has this sort of assumption that there are three functions to government. That every government has three essential functions. One is to give laws, one is to implement laws, and the third is to interpret those laws. So theoretically, in the United States and elsewhere, we have a separation of powers that keeps these three functions separate and are supposed to serve as checks and balances against one another so that all of those functions aren't concentrated in the same entity or in the same branch of government. So we're supposed to have the legislative branch, which is responsible for giving laws. And we're supposed to have the executive branch, which is supposedly responsible for implementing the laws. And finally, we're supposed to have the judicial branch, which is responsible for interpreting these laws. Um, but this is 
only a theoretical separation of powers. That is, uh, that is Halak's claim. If it were true, if there were an actual separation of these functions, it would have been actually compatible with Islamic principles of governance. However, the modern state gathers and concentrates power despite its claims to separating them and creating a system of checks and balances. The modern nation state actually has a, a type of unity and concentration of power that makes true separation practically impossible. So the facts on the ground is that there is no separation of powers when it comes to a modern nation state. There is rather only a distribution, okay? So yes, it is true that the legislative branch has maybe a primary function of uh, being responsible for generating laws or for giving laws. However, the way in which it actually functions delegates these this ability in other ways that ends up concentrating this power in places where it doesn't belong. This okay. happened, yes. Sorry, I'll pause, pause you there. When I was reading the, the, this book, it struck me how theoretical it was, but the separation of powers uh, discussion was very much centered around, I think, the American paradigm. But as you say, it is relevant to other nation states like Britain and, and France nonetheless. But it, it seemed curiously ahistorical uh, to some extent in that, uh, you know, that the modern state is... Uh, in those three areas that you you outlined, it is is quite vulnerable to pressures from outside it, from corporations, from the media, from special interest groups, you can, which can be very powerful uh, interest groups. Not mentioning by name any in America, but that they can influence the legislative process uh, in ways which they might not have been able to do had the the independence of those branches been robust. And that they can encourage certain laws, or and also the issue of um, I forget what it's called in America, where you, you you sponsor people, you give money to congressmen and senators, lobbyists, lobbyists, lobbyists. That's the yeah. term. Sorry, lobbyists. Um, you know, which is a well-oiled machine. Um, you know, the, the, these are private people or businesses who are paid uh, to influence legislate. So, I mean, without going into all that detail, it's just the discussion was quite a historical, a cultural, without a without a social context to some extent. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the real world, the lobbyists, for example, can be very influential. And some lobbyists in Washington, without naming them, are immensely powerful. And <laughs> I, I, I just wish he had, I mean, at this theoretical level, perhaps that's why he didn't mention it. But I mean, I'm sure he, he, he of all people, will know about what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, these are surely big players outside the theoretical constitution of the United States. Sure. Yeah. And actually, if anybody wants a, a, a more detailed discussion on that, we actually discussed that in our video, one of our videos on Talal Assad's uh, formations of the secular, because he was critiquing a certain notion that secular society is a direct access society, the idea of Charles Taylor and these sorts of guys. Um, and Assad showed very convincingly how that's not true at all. This will become very significant to Halak's point in this part of the book because he, we're going to end on the point today that Islamic governance is actually more direct access than what we call democracies today. Yeah. And Islamic governance is actually, in a particular understanding of what it means to, democrat to be democratic, more democratic than what we have called as democracies today. And, and more pluralist in terms of, yes. of, of tolerating um, multiple kinds of legal systems, Christian, Jewish, and, and other, but that's another another subject. So it is yeah. a paradoxically, uh, given the perception in the West of Sharia, Islamic law, actually the opposite is the case historically and for many, many centuries. Right, yes, it's a bunch of smoke and mirrors, really. We have, we have certain doctrines uh, and we believe in them with very, very little evidence. And in fact, when the evidence right in front of our faces flies to the contrary of that, such as the, you know, the um, discourse on freedom, you know, we believe we're the most free and we're in chains everywhere. Uh, and similar to this, okay, so we can say that the idea of separation of powers, um, good in theory, absolutely failed in, in practice. And I will bring actually a, a couple examples to demonstrate, at least in the American context, how this this happens. Um, okay. But before doing that, I, I guess I'll, I'll back up to say that um, there's there's two main ways in which um, that Halak uh, basically introduces as refuting or demonstrating how the modern state amalgamates or concentrates power um, in places that that shouldn't be amalgamating or concentrating power, that this separation, supposed separation of powers is just in word and not in fact at all. One of those is in administrative departments, okay? And so this is a, a big thing in the United States. I'm not sure about the, the context in the UK or France, but administrative departments is one of the 
um, enormous ways in which the legislature is demonstrated to not actually have a monopoly on making law or generating law. In fact, it has given up yeah. this ability. Yeah. Exactly. Tom, can you just clarify? I wasn't sure what he meant, because obviously he's he's an American writing for American context. You're an American. Yes. What do you mean by these administrative departments? I mean, can we name them and, and clarify oh, for totally. everyone? Yes, yeah, very, very good. Very good. Like name any examples. It's, a, it's, a, it's an example less discourse often here. Maybe it's in the footnotes at the back, but you know, I, I want him to name names, and he often did. Sure, sure. Well, we can definitely name names. So I'll <laughs> give you a, a very, um, a, a very uh, relevant example to us here in Utica. So Utica is only twenty minutes south of one of the largest state forests in the country. It's called the Adirondack State State Park. Um, because it's such a concentration of forest and you know unique sort of biospheres and and wetlands and marshes and all these sorts of things, um, it is uh, it is vulnerable to pressures for development and things like that. So, what is the government agency that is responsible for um, preserving this this uh, this body of land or this park system? In the state constitution, there is an amendment, the 14th Amendment of the New York Constitution, that says that this part of the state must remain, quote unquote, forever wild, right? The framers of the New York State Constitution, they recognized that this was not just a state treasure, but a national treasure. Um, and so they wanted to enshrine uh, the, the kind of special character of this place and make sure that it remained unspoiled by uh, modern development or development pressures. However, what is the who is responsible for um, maintaining or implementing or executing this sort of um, part or this amendment of the constitution? They are political agencies that are appointed by the state government. So we have two primary agencies. One of those is called the Department of uh, uh, the the Department of, of Environmental Cons uh, Conservation, the DEC, and the other is called the Adirondack Park Agency, the APA. Now. Where we get into the weeds and how this demonstrates Halak's point is that these are appointed positions. Okay, they're not they're not elected positions whatsoever, right. um, and yet they have enormous authority that spans all three functions of government. Okay, they are able to generate laws and ordinances. Okay, and we recently actually had a um, we recently had a, a lawsuit that brings us to bear. I'll, I'll mention that just in a moment, inshallah. So they also are able to, they're given power to implement these laws. Okay, so that's the executive function. That's sort of more of their natural role because they are appointed. Uh, and then the third is that they are given power to interpret these laws and these amendments. Okay, so I'll give you uh, an example. It, in this part of the state, what does it mean for the Adirondack Park to be preserved as forever wild? Okay, it means that you can't remove, it says in the Constitution, you cannot remove trees of a certain diameter, okay, at all, unless you have some sort of, you have to go through a legal process in order to get an exemption in order to be able to do that. So what happened, we saw that the APA and the DEC were basically caught, these, uh, these government administrations were caught making deals with some of the elected officials from upstate um, small towns to make a snowmobile trail system. And in order to make a, a, a trail system for snowmobiles, the idea was to bring economic development, to bring more tourism through the winter and business and things like that. They had to remove trees. And everybody, you know, we, we have a, a very strict definition of what is a snowmobile trail. It's so many feet wide and it's got such and such features and there's rock removal involved and heavy machi machinery involved and all these sorts of things. It was clearly, prohibited by the way that the New York Constitution was written. However, because the APA and the DEC were the ones in charge of interpreting this, they basically made agreements and started making the trail system without any sort of approval or suggestion from anybody. They just went ahead and did it. They were caught. And one of the environmental nonprofit organizations that I happen to be a member of sued them in violation of, of the Constitution. It was a protracted lawsuit. They eventually lost, thankfully, the New York, um, the state um, the state Supreme Court actually ruled against uh, this sort of practice. But this was an, if nobody had caught them or if nobody had pushed back, this would have been a very, very clear, and the fact that actually damage was done and they have been ordered to replant the trees that they cut down. Um, however, they haven't done that yet. Um, and they're trying to find legal loopholes and, and whatever. But this is a clear example where we have government 
agencies that are appointed with authority to both to give law, implement law, and interpret law. If you want to go to the IRS, okay, or to the DMV, right, when it comes to motor vehicle registration, if you want to go to, um, you know, uh, uh, child protective services, like we can think of many, many different administrative agencies yeah. that are not elected, that are not clearly part of the legislature or the executive branch or the judicial branch that actually for the sake of quote unquote efficiency and convenience are actually given the power of all three, not absolutely in every single case, but largely and often. Okay. So this is the type of amalgamation that actually leads to a type of deep state situation. Okay. We hear about things that are called like the deep state. We had a lot of talk about that here in 2016. We also had a lot of talk about that in Turkey and other sort of places that there are elected officials that rotate right with the elections. They might come and go, but there are administrative agencies that are in power, the FBI, the CIA, you know, MI6 that are in power long past, um, you know, for, for decades. Right. I mean, well, one example that struck me is, is when um, America went in to liberate Iraq. Um, I, I use that with some considerable irony. Um, is I said, I remember reading some a lot of the, the, the military personnel on the ground were uh, special forces and so on, were not actually regular army. These were contractors, so to speak. Uh, these were private companies who supplied weaponry and manpower and so on to. And you know, there's a huge, huge businesses, massive businesses uh, who, who rode in on the back of the, the the state armed forces, I suppose. So that would be a, another kind of really weird thing. You think, well, if the army goes in, it's just the army, but it's not necessarily. It could be a whole bunch of private contractors who are, you know, using um, what, what might be called mercenaries, I suppose. Yeah, very much so. And so this is actually Halak brings this tension to bear. He says, look, this entire administrative apparatus, right, of administrative departments that that are created in the modern nation state are completely against the rule of law okay because the rule of law is premised upon the clear separation of powers and being able to hold certain leaders accountable through voting them in and voting them out etc right they have something to hold them accountable but the 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 modern nation state concentrates power in administrative agencies and those administrative agencies usually combine two, sometimes all three functions of government, and they're not directly accountable to people whatsoever. So we actually have a, a something that is completely against the rule of law. And that's why we can't take people to court, such as those people who work for BlackRock or these sorts of military mercenary companies that were involved in Iraq and... and um, you know, or torturing, right? Torturing people, sometimes American citizens, right? In Guantanamo Bay and sometimes, you know, other people as well, the different sort of uh, black sites, right? That the CIA has used across the world to to detain people without due cause and torture people uh, completely in violation of international law and all that's good and, sa and sacred, right? So there's absolutely no oversight or accountability. And so they operate outside of any sort of sphere of, um, of being accountable that's because they are part of this administrative these administrative agencies uh the deep state this sort of state within a state if you will so the argument is that the modern nation state fundamentally and essentially does this that they are they they will concentrate power in these administrative agencies uh, as a matter of expediency and why they can do it i don't believe that halak says it in this point of the book but if you pay attention to his main sort of thing, why they can do it is because recall that the state is the only legitimate expression of the sovereign popular will, mm -hmm. right? So we have this horrible <clears throat> irony at play where the state is supposed to be the representative of my will and your will and you know whoever else is in this land, you know, the nation, quote unquote, it, the state is supposed to be the representative of our will, but because the state appropriates all sovereignty and all legitimacy for itself and its legitimacy is self-referential, it's not accountable to anybody, right? There's nothing higher than it. Then it is able to then call the shots and say, well, for expediency's sake, we're going to suspend this law or for su expediency's sake, we're going to torture American citizens or attack them with drones or we're going to remove their rights, right? This is what Halak refers to going off of Smith as the state of exception, 
right? So this is this is one of the ways in which the the modern nation state is completely un-Islamic and anti-Islamic because because sovereignty is rooted within the nation state and it's a self-referential legitimacy. It's not accountable to anything higher than itself. It will be able to do these things. It will be able to break the idea of separation of powers. It will be able to create uh, administrative agencies that amalgamate and concentrate power for itself that do all that are ju literally judge, jury, and executioner of uh, whatever sort of thing, whether it's environmental, whether it's legal, whether it's criminal or punitive, whether it's family law, whatever it is. That's um, just uh, yeah, one. Go ahead. Yeah, please. One of the reasons why we're setting up this, this is a contrast. We're setting up a point here, Wallach is to contrast it with another uh, system in in a second. And, and he does stress, uh, he's, he asks at one point, he asks the reader, he asks himself, what, what, why he's pointing out the problems all the time with the system. And he, because there are positive, he says there are positive sides to uh, the American separation of powers. I mean, it's not all do doom and gloom, but he wants to focus on this because if the problems are so severe and structural and systematic, then it might not be possible simply to say everything is fine, just, you know, even though there are good practices. And it's, I mean, undoubtedly are. If one goes to the States, I mean, won't, you know, there are many positive things compared to many other places in the world. Believe me, there are. Um, but, uh, and then, of course, always, as I say, setting up to then move on the second part of this chapter, chapter number three in the book, which is Islamic governance. And that's when the gets really interesting, juxtaposing these two systems. Yes, very good. You're more charitable than I am, uh, ironically. But <laughs> so that was all before we get there, before we juxtapose it with Islamic governance, uh, paradigmatic Islamic governance, not just uh, superficial Islamic governance. The second major sort of thing <clears throat> that Halak brings up as an example for how the separation of powers is basically meaningless. Uh, especially in the American context, is the party system. And again, you'll have to fill me in if this is something that happens in the UK or France or otherwise. Yeah, yeah. That is a short answer. That was very uh, redolent of, of France as well as all the European states, I think. Yeah. Yes. So the yeah. idea behind the separation of powers is that there's going to be a sort of healthy competition between the legislative, between the judicial, between the executive, such that each is going to balance each other out and neither is going to become supreme. However, what has taken the place of that competition, we mm. don't see the judiciary competing with the legislature very much. We don't see the executive competing with the legislature very much. What we see more is the competition between parties. Yep. And so if the party holds the, if one party holds the legislature and the executive, and are able to appoint the Supreme Court justices in our case, right? Then they have carte blanche to do whatever they want, and they do, and they will, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is something that has completely disrupted the idea or the, the theory that we could achieve some sort of separation of powers. What we have instead is collusion instead of competition, okay? If you're able to get your party in power and control the legislature, and control the executive, then you're able to influence the judicial, and then you're just ramming through whatever it is you want. So we don't actually have an achievement of the separation of powers. You have the same political party, both giving laws, implementing laws, and interpreting laws uh, to suit its own sort of agenda and platform. And as you said, if they have lobbyists, which all of them do, then to, to pay back their bankers as well. Um, so that all comes to, and, and there's other sorts of things. We have, we could give more examples as to how the executive at sometimes legislates. In the United States, we have things that are called executive orders. Um, you know, we have instances in which the judiciary actually de facto, like in reality, does legislate as well. We had this big controversy when it came to um, sex discrimination. Okay, uh, the judiciary in the United States started interpreting sex discrimination, which was an amendment passed in the 60s and 70s, started interpreting it to also include sexual orientation. They were in fact legislating when they did that act of interpretation. Some acts of judicial interpretation actually have legislative uh, consequences, right? And so that was kind of a shortcut sneaky method as opposed to going through the legislature and trying to get something passed, a separate thing passed that was going to prevent a certain type of discrimination based off of uh, sexual orientation. Rather than do that, because that would have been more difficult, they tried to simply reinterpret uh, something that had already been passed and therefore they uh, in fact had a legislative ability. So these these three things, as Halak says, they're not hard and fast. There is no real separation of power. What we have is just a uh, an emphasis of distribution.
you know, the legislative branch um, maybe gives more laws than the executive branch, but it's actually really quite messy. And the modern nation state concentrates power. There's a type of unity at play. Um, and because the state is invested with this uncontroversial and unassailable sovereignty that has nobody to call it account to, there's no, there's no law higher than the state. The state's law is the only law. Then this is something that is fundamentally un-Islamic and actually anti-Islamic. So coming around to then what is Islamic governance? Again, not a superficial Islamic governance where we say that you know the Quran and the Sunnah are the sources of our constitution and we really just have the, Im the imported French legal system or British legal system, but we say that, well, it's derived from the Quran and Sunnah. No, the paradigmatically Islamic governance, right? Governance that actually is, um, uh, the entire lens is Islamic, not just certain bits and pieces as it suits the modern nation state. Um, we'll juxtapose it with the sovereignty, right? So recall that within the modern nation state, the nation is what is sovereign, the imagined nation, okay? And the state is supposedly the only um, eligible or the only legitimate representation of that sovereign will. And so it is able to generate law. It has the exclusive right, a monopoly on the generation of law and coercion and violence and everything that follows from that. It is the ultimate authority. There is no higher authority than the state. Uh, if the state wants to dissolve religion tomorrow, it can do it. If the state wants to dissolve the Bill of Rights and the amendments and everything that has been gained through so-called democratic processes, then the state can do it. Because the state is invested with this type of sovereignty, it's mm. seen as representing the political will of the quote unquote nation. Um, so it has the ability to do it. That is completely different from the, uh, the idea of Islamic governance. Okay, so in Islamic governance, sovereignty does not rest in, we're gonna compare concepts here. So we have the nation on one hand, we would probably juxtapose that with the ummah on the other hand, okay? Yes. We do have the concept of the ummah, and this is something that Halak cites. Can However- you, Tom, can you just define the word ummah? Oh, yeah. sure. So the ummah is essentially all of the individual members that make up um, all the individual Muslim members that exist currently, and it's also mm -hmm. the territory that's defined by the application of the Sharia. Okay, so it can refer to two things. One, you know, Ummah as a Paul's a Muslim and I'm a Muslim and everybody in this room is a Muslim. We're part of the same Ummah community is the word that uh, Halak is to translate it. But it also has the connotation of the territory that is under the jurisdiction of the Sharia. Right. So where is sovereignty? That's the main question that Halak wants us to think about. Where is sovereignty vested in, yeah. uh, in, in Islamic governance? And of course, sovereignty is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Allah says very directly in the Quran, that all sovereignty is Allah's. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he delegates, we could say, some of the sovereignty, or a better word would be, he expresses the sovereignty in what? In the Sharia. Okay, so the Sharia is the expression of Allah's sovereignty and political will. So uh, that, well, yes. it occurred, occurred to me what what you're what you're saying uh, actually is not unique to Islam. is actually found in the Bible. So you, you'll find many verses in the Psalms and elsewhere. You know, God Yahweh is is the sovereign, the Lord, the controller, the owner. Everything in the, in the heavens and the earth, and you'll get God giving laws. You have the Ten Commandments. We have the six hundred thirteen commandments in the midst of the law. But most people today, most Christians, I mean, and it's not meant to be polemical, just an observation in America and Europe and so on, are, are secular liberals. They, they, mm -hmm. they, they believe in secular democracy. So in practice, they absolutely disregard this. Uh, our own sovereign state, as you described it, is perfectly competent and sovereign to make its own laws, which, of course, mm -hmm. is antithetical to the biblical uh, perspective as well as the um, Islamic one. But, but Muslims haven't, I don't think, given up that perspective that you're about to uh, uh, share with us and Halak so beautifully explains. But I think most Christians are basically secular humanists with a religious veneer. Again, I don't mean that polemically, I just mean that sociologically or yeah. descriptively. Yeah, exactly. And Halak, would, uh, he references this actually in The Impossible State. He says that it's not just the Islamic state that's an impossible state. Okay, the Islamic state is just as impossible as a Buddhist state or as a Christian state because mm. he's saying that this is exactly the difference between uh, the modern nation state and everything else that came before, right? That's mm. his whole thing is that everything else that came before pre-modernity and modernity, yes, we can draw a line and we can say that there is a fundamental and essential difference between governance and specifically sovereignty 
on each side of those two lines. If you go back before the modern nation state, sovereignty was understood to belong to the creator, whether that was exactly like a, a biblical sort of account or whether that was Islamic or any sort of other um, you know, uh, permutation that, that we had. It was only with the modern nation state, what makes it so special is that sovereignty is invested in the state by itself. Yes. Technically, technically the sovereignty is in the nation, but the nation is a fictitious sort of, you know, entity that the state claims the only right to represent. And so in practice, the sovereignty only belongs to the actual state itself, which means that it's completely unhinged, that it's completely, it has nothing to hold itself accountable to, uh, no law higher than its law. Right. Whereas if you go even back in British history and I took British history in college, you know, we have the divine uh, right of kings and we have these sort of, you know, the Magna Carta. And we have all these sort of traditions that people kind of plot on the so-called progressive history of uh, what brought us to democracy or parliament or whatever. But in reality, it's a very, very different political arrangement. It's an, ex mm -hmm. an entirely different arrangement in that sovereignty is put in God. Sovereignty is put in God first, and any sort of sovereignty that exists in the world is a derived sovereignty. It's a contingent sovereignty. It's a sovereignty that is held accountable to some sort of higher law, whether it's a moral law or an actual legal sort of uh, regime. And yeah. so that is the big that is the big difference. And so we're only yes, it's true. Yes, go ahead. I dropped. Right. I just wanted to. I mean, obviously, we're looking at this book by the Possible State. Um, if I may, just it's just one paragraph here. I'd just like to read out page fifty. Oh, sure. of the book. Thank you. Um, which directly speaks to what you're saying. This actually really occasionally he becomes almost quite lyrical. Just like, he's not always very lyrical, but sometimes he is. And I think that this speaks very powerfully to the point that you're making. We're discussing. He says on page fifty, God is the sovereign because he literally owns everything. Wow. Human human ownership of any kind. I'm thinking of the house I'm sitting in now. You're OK. I own this house. right? Including the absolutely unencumbered ownership of property is merely metaphorical and ultimately unreal. Wow. Blows my mind. Um, it is uh, at best derivative of the original state of sovereign ownership. You just made that point. This explains, he said, and this is a fascinating example. People in the West don't get this. It's fascinating. This explains, for instance, why in Islam, the care for the poor is legislated as their right. How can their right, okay, against the wealth of the well-to-do? Since the wealth of the latter, the rich, is God's. It's God's, any, it's God's money anyway. And God's compassion is first and foremost bestowed on the poor, the orphans, and the wretched of the earth. If you want to find out that's true, just read the Quran and the authentic Hadith. If the physical world, he says, in its entirety is derivative, as you just said, Tom, then it cannot have any real form of original possession, including possession of a law or a moral code. Where did, yeah, you just made that point. It is God, therefore, who is this sole legislator. And it is with him and him alone that sovereignty and sovereign will lies. If the modern state sovereign will is represented in the law, so is God's sovereign will. The law of the Muslim God, as he puts it, is the Sharia, pure and simple. And the Sharia is the moral code, a representation of his moral will, God's moral will, the first and final concern. The rest, he says, is details, including the technical body of the law and more importantly, any form of worldly political rule. The Sharia, God's law and will, precedes any and all such rule, both logically and in time, end quote. I just thought that was such a beautifully concise and rich intellectual exposition of the contrast between the two systems. Yeah, that really hits at the heart of it. And that's precisely what we're getting at here. Rather yeah. than sovereignty being vested in the ummah, sovereignty belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, how do obviously we discern uh, Allah's sovereign right. will? It's expressed through his sharia, which then puts it, if we're going to go into polemics, um, it makes the Islamic model uh, much more robust and much more convincing because we have a much clearer expression of, of the creator's sovereign will in the sharia than we do in any other system that exists, whether it's biblical law or other sorts of, you know, religious traditions, if, if we're to 
grant them the possibility that they were at one time an expression of divine will, then they are very partial and they are very um, sort of, you know, um, compromised, let's say. Mm -hmm. However, when it comes to the Sharia of Islam, this is something that is um, extremely detailed, extremely comprehensive and extremely well preserved expression of Allah's moral will, which is also a political will. What this means, one of the implications of this is that who are the representatives of mm -hmm. this sovereign will? Okay, yeah. or or who are the, um, you know, we don't want to say necessarily middlemen, but the interpreters, okay, of this will, which is expressed in the Sharia. It's not the state. No. It's, it's not the government. It's not the, it's not it's the Quran. Point. Uh, this is something that needs to be stressed many times, underlined. Uh, this is the difference. Yes, exactly. It's not the government. It's not the government at all. Okay, it is the ulama, it is the scholars, and we'll talk about you know some other sort of pieces. Features. The mufti and the qadi, to use the technical jargon, we're talking about muftis and qadis, uh, you know, uh, judges. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And he says in, in other of his works, you know, there's basically four sort of you know roles within the ulama that are especially uh, important to the kind of the legal dimension of of the sharia. Uh, there's the mufti, there's the qadi, there's the faqih. Uh, and the law professor. So these sorts of four represent the class of ulama, like the class of Islamic scholars that are the interpreters of the creator's sovereign will expressed through his sharia. Okay, so we're going to talk about a couple of things, why that's so significant and why is it so radically different from mm. the, the, the state, the modern nation state that we have today and why that actually results in a more democratic and representative society than the the current society that we have today under the modern nation state. So, uh, first of all, we have um, you know I, there's this one line that uh, that uh, that Halak says that I, I really really appreciate this phrase. He says, "What is the role of the ulama?" Because somebody might hear, "Oh my gosh, religious scholars. We're going back to the Pope. We're going back to." Uh, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed and all this sort of excommunication and all this sort of thing. No, no, no. Actually, that's an interesting example of what happened in the church of an amalgamation or concentration of power where the government structure was able to express e ecclesiastical control, right? Where they were actually able to control from top down what were the orthodox interpretations and what were the bounds within which that we can interpret the moral law, which is the creator's uh, sort of revelation. And in Islamic history, it was the exact opposite, okay? That um, it was bottom that, up rather than top down. But exactly. Is that, that the, the ulama as a class, right? The religious scholars as a class were um, completely different. They were locally embedded, that they were, uh, that they were represented all different classes of people, right? They were from the poor, they were from different yeah. ethnicities, they were from the Mawali, right? They were from people who were Arab or not Arab, freed slaves, former slaves, all these sorts of different classes of people. And so we have a way in which um, this is actually a much more democratic and egalitarian society than what we have now. But before before I get into that, I'll just drive the, the final point home when it comes to thinking about it. Um, zooming out okay we're talking about everything in within the, a sharia system has to be held accountable to the sharia and the ulama okay this is the main paradigmatic difference or one of them it's really an implication from talking about where is sovereignty located how is sovereignty expressed okay as opposed to the modern nation state where there is no law higher than the law of the state mm -hmm. you cannot hold the state accountable really to anybody else. The state reserves the ability to declare martial laws, to suspend rights as it sees fit. Or okay. change the definition of marriage or, or change the definition of gender and so yes. on and so on. It's a never-ending kind of yes. process. Yeah. All rights must be recognized and, and pursued through the state within the modern nation state. Whereas within the Islamic system of governance, um, you have everything is accountable to the Sharia. You have the ruler is accountable to the Sharia, the ulama, the interpretive class is accountable to the Sharia, and every single subject is accountable to the Sharia. It is the highest law, and it is the law of God. And so there is nothing higher than it. So you have a situation where the government is accountable to a higher uh, 
thing than itself, which is the main difference that Halak wants us to notice. So it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient to just take um, this verse and that verse and this this criminal punishment, right, or that crim criminal punishment, and say, oh, look, we have an Islamic state. It's a contradiction in terms. If you don't have a government that is accountable to the Sharia itself, if you have a government, we don't care what your sources are. We don't care how, you know, what sort of laws you're implementing. If it is not accountable to something higher than itself, a scholarly class that is not controlled, we'll get to that in a second, not controlled by that government, then this is not an Islamic state. This is not an Islamic government. Excuse me. This is not a, a situation where the Sharia is actually being able to be implemented uh, in the way in which it was intended. So how do we achieve that? Okay, because somebody could say, and we were touching on this just a second. I kind of got ahead of myself. They say that, okay, um, what's to prevent us getting into a situation where the Christian Church got in, especially the Catholic Church, where we just have this: the government and the ecclesiastical authorities are in cahoots with one another, and it actually is a very sort of totalitarian um, situation. That we have we have two sorts of things that are different about the Islamic governance that save it from this and also save it from the problems and pitfalls of the modern nation state. One of them is within the law itself, okay? And the second one is in the interpreters themselves. So we're nice and organized, go, uh, proceeding here. What's in the law itself that saves it from abuse and this totalitarian sort of thing that we've seen from other governments, especially Christian governments in the past? First of all, we have legal pluralism that is built into the Sharia, okay? And that means two things. One, it means that a plurality of legal systems are simultaneously allowed to exist according to people's subscribed beliefs, right? So you have a certain sort of set of laws that applies to Muslims and another set of laws that the Christians live by and another set of laws that Jews live by, et cetera, et cetera. That this is recognized not as something that is a deficiency or something that the Sharia hadn't accounted for. No, this is actually something that is embedded within the Sharia, right? As a, a mm -hmm. fundamental feature of the Sharia, that it would understand. It, it yes, me, it's much more that this, this Islamic paradigm that you're describing here very accurately is much more morally, ethnically advanced than the Western secular model. Say like here in France, there is one size fits all. In fact, everyone must conform to this same size or you're punished, you're sanctioned, you're cancelled, whatever, legally, politically, culturally, in every way. The, the Islamic paradigm, however, is much more recognizing of religious and ethical diversity uh, and much more civilized, if I can put it that way, even though the French think they're terribly civilized. Um, and in many ways they are, of course, when it comes to cheese and all sorts of things. But no, seriously, but on this, on this subject, the Islamic paradigm strikes me personally as light years ahead. And that's why one of the reasons why the author of this book, Awala Halak, is, is on record, is on YouTube, actually, uh, being interviewed in Arabic, but with English subtitles, where he, as a Christian, Palestinian Christian, would much prefer to live under a Sharia-based system than in the United States, where he's actually a citizen. And he explains why. And this guy knows what he's talking about. He's no fool. Uh, and, it's, and it's partly to do with this reason, also the way that the West treats minorities as second-class citizens and so on, but that's a different subject. But uh, I just wanted to st stress that this is, um, in my personal opinion, a very much more advanced system than the current Western secular one. Yes, if and this is something that I, honestly Talal Asad I think underestimated that Halak understands better than than Talal Asad, Asad did. If I could be so bold as to say that, is that when it comes to the fact that the nation state claims all all law for itself, mm. then it can only relate to its subjects in the spirit of conformity and domination. That's right. The subjects have to conform to that one singular law because oh, yeah. that one singular law literally is the power of the state. Yes. To attempt to live by a law outside of the state is to challenge the modern nation state in the most fundamental way. Absolutely. Right? You can't have your own your own law. And we see this actually, honestly, we see this in the United States of America because we have indigenous nations that continue to live among us um, that so they have this sort of interesting status depending on where you're at, where they have tribal law or they have law that, that applies to certain territories that they have nominal control over. But when the rubber meets the road, Right, when we're talking about criminal uh, proceedings and criminal law and things like that, there was actually one of the um, one of the groups uh, here in, in in upstate New York attempted to make its own passports. Mm. 
and attempted to travel with them to go because, you know, actually the Native Americans of this area invented the game lacrosse. And so I believe they were trying to go to some sort of lacrosse championship uh, abroad and they made their own passports and they almost forced the issue. It was almost to say, okay, well, you're telling us that we have some sort of sovereignty and we have some sort of ability to rule ourselves. Uh, let's let's put your money where your mouth is. And of course, they were denied. They, their passports were not recognized. They had to go through the modern nation state that is the United States of America because, by definition, the modern nation state has to be the only law. It has to exhibit or exhort, excuse me, exert a complete monopoly on the ability to make law and to implement it and all the violence and coercion that goes along with that. So that's, so I got a little sidetracked, but we're saying that um, what makes the Sharia system of governments diff different? We said that one of those, uh, one way is what's built into the law itself. What second is in the interpreters. Within the law itself, we talked about legal pluralism and the first type of legal pluralism existed between Muslims and other sort of faith groups. But the second type of legal pluralism actually exists within Muslims, right? Or between Muslims. We have the Hanafi school of law. We have the Shafi'i school of law. We have the Hanbali school of law and the Maliki school of law. Different interpretive regimes, different uh, emphases or interpretive principles that lead to valid conclusions or recognized valid conclusions, right? So there's a probabilistic nature to legal reasoning outside of the circle of what's ijma' and what's known like absolutely with certainty, the vast majority, and this is not a controversial statement to those who have studied Islam in Arabic and Islamic law, the vast majority of Islamic law is dhanni. It is built on probabilistic reasoning. And, and you, but by the way, you, you just to say, you're not, you're no amateur layman. You've actually studied Sharia in Arabic at yes. a university in Medina? I yes, in Medina. Yeah, that's my that's my second degree. Right. So this is we're not talking about min haith al min haith al riwaya or min haith al um it, we're talk we're not talking about its authenticity. Okay? We're talking about we're not talking about min haith al dalil we're talking about min haith al dalala. We're talking about in terms of how certain does one particular piece of evidence lead to the conclusion that we're saying that it comes to? Okay, the vast majority of things in Islamic law are considered dhanni or they're probabilistic conclusions. Okay, so what's significant about this, we're talking about outside the circle of ijma, is that something that is arrived to probabilistically admits two things. It admits the possibility of error. Okay, so it's open to being amended. And it also admits the possibility that the truth is elsewhere. That, okay, we have this particular, this is my belief, but the truth might be with the, the Hanbalis on this one, or it might be with the Malikis, or it might be with the Hanafis on this one. So this is something that is, again, not an accidental feature. It's a structural, systemic feature of the law. And so this is something that results in much more... Um, much better outcomes and consequences and results with the Islamic uh, system of governance than with our current modern nation state, which the law is univocal. Okay, the law only means one thing. Um, or if the law is going to change meaning, it's going to be at the behest of state interests. Um, and there is no such thing as legal pluralism. Uh, it is only one law for everybody, and everybody has to get with the program and submit conform, and conform. conform. Conform is the key here, especially in yeah. France. So that was only number one. Okay, so we're talking about what makes the Sharia governance different. Why is it bottom up? By it bottom up, why is it perhaps even more democratic than the democratic modern nation state? One was features built into the law itself. Two has to do with those interpreters. Okay, let's say that you, God forbid, have to go to court in the United States. Okay, you better have deep pockets. <laughs> I like that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that you 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 better have deep pockets. That is all I can say because you're going to have to pay a lot of money for a lawyer to interpret the sort of legal jargon. You're going to have to, you know, there's court expenses involved in e just to, to get into court what's, you know, at all. Who are the people who make up judges? Okay. Is it average people like you and me? My, my father worked as, as, as a trash collector. No, the people who make up the class of people who go on to become judges are by and large people from the wealthy elite. Okay, so it's not something that is very democratic. It's not something that is very representative. And this is one of the things that people get uh, obsessed with, with in democracy or thinking about what is democratic. They get obsessed with the technology of votes and the, the idea of majority rule. That's not the only way to conceptualize democracy. If we're conceptualizing democracy as majority rule, then yes, of course, then this is something that is not necessarily um, Islamic. It might not be 
un-Islamic, but it's definitely not necessarily Islamic um, in and of itself. However, if we understand something as democratic as something that is representative, okay, because what's the purpose of majority rule? What's the purpose of electing anybody in the first place? Are we fetishizing this political technology or is it supposed to actually achieve some sort of political value? The political value it was supposed to achieve is actually being represented in your government, mm -hmm. is representation, right? So what if there's another way to achieve representation without necessarily the majority rule or the elections or things like that? What if there's another type of governance that achieves the aims of representation better than the modern nation state whether it's democratic or not. What if the same goes for rule of law? What if there's another system of governance that achieves rule of law better than the modern nation state? We're saying that the Sharia does, Islamic governance does. It actually achieves representation and the rule of law better than a modern nation state does, better than a modern democracy does, because reason number two, number one was because of what's baked into the law. Number two is who are those interpreters? Who are the fuqaha? Who are the uh, the muftis? Who are the qadis? Who are the people who are interpreting the law? Who are the people that are uh, implementing the law? Who are the people who are, um, you know, they're they're judging over things. They're judging over things and helping the people with their cases. They are people who are locally embedded. They are from poor classes, just as they are from rich classes. They are people who are legally and financially independent from the government. That's key. They're legally that's and financially that's independent that's from the government. And so they are not simply cogs in the system of generating or uh, or interpreting the state's law at the behest of the state. I, I, I remember made by the state. Uh, They're completely yeah, uh, outside of that system. Uh, at some point in the in the history of Egypt in the 20th century, I'm far from knowledgeable about it. But at some point, I remember reading that the, the people at Al-Azhar and elsewhere, at some point who were independent before, independent of the state, independent of the rulers, became employees of the state, became civil servants, uh, paid by them. And, and this move, I think, happened in the 1950s, 1960s, whenever it was, was a real paradigm shifting moment because for the reasons you, you they were no longer independent. They were salaried civil servants of the rulers. And, ha and how does that uh, affect their fatwas, their rulings and so on? Well, you can imagine. That's right. Yeah. Give me a fatwa, right? Uh, a fatwa, fatwa on demand sort of service. Exactly. So the who was the mufti? Who was the legal specialist in the, the Islamic lands or in Islamic governments or, or governance or within the Sharia? The, the whole interpretive class, these people who are responsible for interpreting the, the expressed will of Allah in the Sharia, it is a class of people who arise organically based off of their merit. They're not appointed by position or for nepotism or knowing anybody. They are decentralized. They're not centrally uh, under any sort of control of any sort of government structure. They are, it's egalitarian in nature in that it is open access. If you're poor, you can get there as long as you study, as long as you actually know what you're talking about, whether you're black or white or red or yellow or any sort of color, it doesn't matter. Whether you are, um, you are legally independent, okay? You're somebody who is, and this is a crucial, crucial point when it comes to today, especially the spaces that we have to move within the United States of America, where we still have some degree of freedom of education that's outside of the state. They're not being educated by the state. They're not being educated by the government. They're not being taught what to think. Their entire education is outside of the government. And so they're able point, to, yes, go ahead. Yeah. So I just in France recently, the law a law was passed in recently in, in France to stop Muslim parents uh, arranging for the education of their own children independently of the state. In other words, homeschooling. Yes. And this, this was criminalized here. Can you believe it? So only the secular state will, will virtually own the children's education and influence them and form them according to secular values. Because it's exactly what France wants, of course. There's no yes. action. And so it's actually now no longer allowed for Muslim parents to, but before they were homeschooling them. Yeah, and that's uh, in, the, in, the, in the footsteps of Sweden who beat them to it. And this is actually the logical conclusion of the secular modern nation state. Um, it's actually just something that's a, 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 a rupture from that paradigm that what exists in the United States where we still have that freedom. But the logical, if sovereignty is in the state, then the state has to control all education. It, it controls all law, it controls all coercion, and it has to have a monopoly over these sorts of things. Sorry, and I'm it breaks down the the family because children uh, parents no longer uh, can can bring up their own children, their own family. They, they they must give away their children in effect to the state, 
at the earliest possible time and the state will determine what those children get taught their value system their beliefs their character everything is 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 from the state and this is not only profoundly undemocratic it's also profoundly unconservative uh uh in in the, in the best sense it's a very worrying development but many people here want it that way that they, they anyway that's a different matter but you're absolutely right in pinpointing this as a key definition i think yeah, so one of the so this is one of the key features of the Sharia society or true Islamic governance, paradigmatic Islamic governance, is that education is completely outside of the control of the government, uh, and that especially the legal specialists, those who are interpreting the Sharia, who are holding the government to account and holding the leaders to account or to accountability of the Sharia or under the Sharia, are independent and educated independent from that government that they are legally independent from the government and that they are also financially independent of the government as well, as was the time-honored tradition within Muslim lands, is that mo the vast majority of scholars, even if they received some sort of stipend from the government for being a judge, which was you know very, fairly typical, they almost always had some other sort of profession from which they made their main livelihood. So they weren't in a compromised position. They did not have to uh, rule or interpret um, at the behest of the government. Not that it didn't exist at all. Yes, you can go in the history books and find individuals who did and the, the governments throughout Muslim history attempted to try to pack the bench with people like that. But it did not exist in a structural systemic way like it exists in the, in the modern nation state. The modern nation state, these things are paradigmatic. You can't get away from them. They are structural. They're fundamental to them. Whereas within Islamic governments, the structure and the system is entirely different and Allah knows best. Is that, are you completed your presentation? That's pretty much it. I guess I'll just say one final thought. So if this is, if, if what it takes to be democratic um, yeah. is not simply majority rule, it's not simply, um, you know, elections and all of that and casting votes, but it's really about being a bottom up society. It's really about being, uh, achieving representation in government. It's really about holding leaders to accountability, to legal accountability. It's about the rule of law then I would posit and Halak posits that the Islamic governance, that the Sharia system is much more democratic than any modern nation state or any modern democracy in the world today. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Thank you very much. I, I'm just going to conclude as well by adding a, a further short paragraph uh, from uh, Halak's book, The Impossible State, uh, page uh, 51, um, which addresses or summarizes uh, what you've been discussing. He says, um, a, 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 he, he makes a decisive point, he says. This is a decisive point he makes in his book. There can be no Islam without a moral legal system that is anchored in a metaphysic. Now, this is his code word, I think, for the sovereignty of God. In other words, the, the theological realm. There can be no such moral system without or outside divine sovereignty. And at the same time, there can be no modern state without its own sovereignty and sovereign will. For no one, I think, can reasonably argue that the modern state can do without this essential form property of sovereignty. So he's saying kind of secular self-referential, as you called it, Tom, system of the modern state is definitional to its understanding. If all these premises are true, he says, as they are, as they ineluctably must be, then, and this is so key to the penny dropping for me, then the modern state can no more be Islamic than Islam can come to possess a modern state. Okay, and then in parentheses he says, interestingly, unless of course the modern state is entirely reinvented, in which case we must, as we're entitled to, call it something else, close quote. And if, as important and foundational as this conclusion may be, it is only the beginning of a longer story with multiple and multifaceted profound implications. And that, for the reader, is the rest of the book, of course. So, um, uh, yes, this third chapter, which Tom has been uh, very uh, ably and articulately ex uh, expositing for us, is by far the most interesting section of the book so far. I mean, I admittedly haven't finished it. Um, and I do recommend the book just on the strength of that individual chapter. And here we have the impossible triangle, as I say, on, on the cover, illustrating uh, the impossible state. And I just noticed a little detail there, a little bit of um, Islamic um, artwork just inside there, which suggests you're trying to Islamicize the, the state, the modern state, which is, of course, impossible. And then maybe the green there is meant to be is the Islamic color as well, perhaps. But maybe I'm reading too much into the design. I think you're a future as an art critic. <laughs>
Absolutely. <laughs> no, I'll stick to theology. Um, well, thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Tom, for, as always, your um, outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, in, yeah. Inshallah, Professor, uh, well, I will be watching it, and who knows, he may even watch it as well. Um, and um, thank you very much. Anything you want to say in conclusion? Oh, something I want to say in conclusion before I forget. Imam Tom has a fantastic YouTube channel entitled Usaka Masjid, which I will link to in the description below. I never tell people to subscribe to anything apart from this channel. Do subscribe, you won't regret it. And that, dear colleagues and friends and everyone else, viewers, is it. So until next time, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.